To be honest, I, I don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> A lot of farmers from around Beijing would find arrowheads in the ground and they would come and bring them to the city on weekends to sell them for sometimes a pack of cigarettes or other things or, or just a little bit of money. Uh, so I built up a collection of um, I think about 130 arrowheads and there's quite a portion of them in there that are actually of this shape. Yeah, so this is a, a drawing of what I think one of my antiques would have looked like when new. I thought in an armor piercing test, if you want to test uh, the head performance against the plate, it's also good to have a little bit of a, a long tang, all within historical uh, proportions. Um, I've worked to sketches that I've done, that I've got from uh, museum archives that I've been in when I've weighed and measured uh, and I've scaled. I've made chisel heads before. Uh, European socketed ones, but they're quite different. They, I've, those are the first times I've ever made those. I've never handled a head that looks like that either. Yeah, I remember that well. That's really hot, that. <laughs> you have plenty to drink. That's the uh, rough forging of a tank. It's not quite finished. Um, what I do after that pro step in the process is I'd take it and I'd hot file it to tidy up the shoulder. Yeah, that's, um, that's one where it's just about finished forging and it's ready for grinding and pointing. Um, that there is a, um, well, it's, it's just after it's, I've finished forging really, it's cooling down. That's just before I'm gonna thermal cycle and then I'd harden it. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably uh, pretty much spot on because the, especially in the earlier periods, the, the steel used for these arrowheads was usually also a, a lower carbon. Sometimes they would have inserted edges just like a sword with very high carbon, but those were only the highest quality heads. So the majority of the army wouldn't have access to them. And uh, we then sent the heads over to John Potter, a, a master Fletcher, who is uh, your friend, I believe, John. But this would be um, a fairly typical construction. So you would have uh, the tank inserted into wood and then wrapped traditionally uh, with sinew, but it could be any strong fiber. Um, one of the main important things with a fitting like this is that uh, where the tang ends in the arrow, that there's no open space. And this is just a depiction of the soldiers wearing brigandine, uh, performing various military maneuvers. Either here you see, you know, some are archers, one's holding a musket at the very top. Um, others have melee weapons. And the earliest finding that we know so far of uh, the Ming Dynasty brigandine armor was actually a very interesting one. It was uh, found in uh, General Mu Ang's uh, uh, tomb in Nanjing. And uh, it is basically a mixture of brigandine and scale armor. This, this is a Qing Dynasty Burgundy. Uh, government uh, mass production, probably government sample armor. They, they send to different uh, workshops, and you know they, they are supposed to uh, make according uh, to to these samples. Uh, from what I know, these uh, these were found in a Tibetan monastery. So, so yeah, quite quite unique the the, the pattern on on the, on the fabric. running this across, it's not really biting, whereas the same amount of pressure I apply this to the head of the arrow, and it kind of sticks. So I would say that this arrowhead, if anything, is um, slightly softer than the armor. Well, I think the, the I think they, uh, they may have a hard time go through the plates directly.
predictions? I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. I think Armour probably works, otherwise they wouldn't have worn it. 